sound will be okay either way, but you will be behind in the future. Ah, I see. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not that attractive that I have to be in the picture. <laughs> I'm here, yes. Hello. So if you want to use laser point. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Yes. That's Mario. Mario, will, Mario Montero will share this session. Ready to go. So are we ready to start, please? So good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for being here on time. So we have a busy morning, but we will start with the important things. Cheryl has a few announcements. Oh, couple. That's not on. Okay, we can make this one. So I just want to mention that some people are um, interested in perhaps sharing a ride to the airport. I've put a flip chart out in front. Um, if, you, if you have a room in your car or if you need a ride, you can sign up on there. I know someone needs a ride back around 4 o'clock. If anyone's going to the airport today, leaving here 4-ish, Rick in the back row would love a ride. Um, uh, okay, so um, also if you would like to send me your, a PDF of your talk or of your um, poster, I would be happy to receive that. We can post it on the website. That's just a reminder. And um, when we have our break at 1040, we would love to take a group photo. So if everybody would make their way just right outside the front door, um, we'll do a quick photo. And um, thank you very much. And thanks for coming as well. Thank you very much, Cheryl. I will remind you for all of the photo when we finish this first section. So we are moving on. So our first speaker, Marcus, Marcus Hort, is telling us about ground-based observations. Yes, first of all, thank you for the organizers to giving me the chance to present some work which was going on with uh, Michael. Uh, I chose this title, A Future Path for Solar Synoptic Ground-Based Observations, because it's a title of a paper that Michael uh, was involved with and where he uh, pushed for getting it published, uh, published in Frontiers, the journal where he was one of the, the editors. And uh, we, he was visiting in June 2018, sorry, not 2019, June 2018, the last time in Freiburg when we were set sitting together to work on that. But unfortunately, we didn't get it finished. Uh, so otherwise, it would have been probably printed already. And we need to make now the effort, uh, the remaining authors, to get it done and printed. It's the summary of work we did for SPRING. SPRING stands for the Solar Physics Research Integrated Network Group, and that's the topic of my talk today. By the way, there will be another uh, issue of uh, the Journal Frontiers, a topical issue which Michael initiated and asked uh, uh, Joyce Guzik and myself to be the uh, editors of it. That's the future of astroseismology, where we collected a nice sample of papers, and thank you for, to everybody who submitted papers so far. Uh, we are working on that, getting the refereeing done, and I hope we have a nice collection of, of papers coming up soon. Yeah, there were some paths gone, and some paths are ahead. Uh, so I cannot miss a talk about Michael with having a few words about HELAS, where he was involved in. There were a couple of projects, and the first one which initiated pro uh, he, uh, our collaboration was uh, a project funded under Framework Program 6 of the EU from 2007 to 2010, which was HELAS, which had which brought the community together and which formed this consortium, which is an international consortium by now. We are far beyond the European dimension. We have a lot of international uh, partners in there now. We continued with the collaboration project SPACEIN, also by EU funding. And then uh, the High Resolution Solar Physics Network was formed, uh, which focused on integrating activities for solar physics in Europe, and where SPRING became one of the work packages, thinking about this new ground-based observations where we had two funding lines uh, also in the past. Uh, well, for HELAS, Mike took over the activity on global helioseismology, uh, activity which he was chairing very successfully. And uh, then uh, a hard way was ahead of us because that was a project which was demanding because we were organizing a lot of conferences. He took over the organization of the first international conferences jointly with Soho and Gong in Sheffield. Uh, then we had meetings in Göttingen, 
and uh, which was organized by, by Laurent and his group there, which was also a very successful meeting. Uh, we had smaller workshops on local helioseismology and global, on, on, on global helioseismology and on astroseismology. And here we had the famous meeting where we analyzed the so-called HeLa sunspot, which showed that helioseismology has a problem in analyzing sunspots, uh, which we had follow-up meeting in Berlin on that. Uh, and you see a lot of people here, which are also uh, here in, in this, at this conference. But there were further workshops, uh, so we had a hard time and a lot of traveling all across Europe. Uh, Mario was organizing one on global helioseismology in, in Ponte de Lima. And uh, the last big HELAS conference, besides the COCO conference, which we had in Paris, was on, on Lanzarote, uh, where we also met with, uh, and the, the meetings were growing bigger and bigger, and it was showing that astroseismology is clearly taking off, and that a lot of work was done in helioseismology. Yeah, to compensate for the hard work, we also had nice board meetings. So that's how the board meetings looked like. So we were invited by Don for one of our first board meetings in, in North Lees. Uh, I remember that one. Uh, we had a hard board meeting in, in Porto because we had to taste a lot of port wine there. And uh, that's why when I started to love port wine. And uh, that was one of the last meetings where also Kate was present, uh, at least for the dinner that we had at, afterwards uh, in, in Lanzarote. What were the results of that? Well, we had many papers. We did, used a lot of tools, a lot of data products. We tried to structure the research area, especially in helio and astroseismology and stellar physics. We prepared for the new missions to get ready for the analysis of Coro data, STO data, and Kepler data uh, to strengthen helio and astroseismology. And I think we initiated a lot of collaborations with uh, produced a lot of scientific results. And we were able to support a lot of young scientists uh, to get abroad and to get their career started. We started also to, always to think about the future of the, what will be the key research infrastructures for the field. And this thinking is still going on, and uh, especially on instrumentation and also on e-infrastructures. That means the, uh, the uh, big computer facilities that we need. And in particular, here together with NSO and uh, Frank started to think about the next generation of Gong and brought this discussion into uh, this group of people to think what will be the next generation of Gong and uh, how to continue with our research. And the next generation of Gong, that is what uh, Frank always suggested, was to serve a larger community. And this idea was then supported by Michael, I think especially when he became director here at HAO. He picked up uh, and supported us. And so we sat together and, and brought us some of the points that we would need for synoptic observations of the sun, which are reflected also in, a, uh, in some of publications here together, uh, uh, Frank and I together with, uh, with Mike. And here we're a result of an ISI meeting, which Mike also initiated. So uh, we need a long-term monitoring of the solar magnetic fields. Otherwise, we don't understand the solar dynamo. We need to understand how the solar cycle evolves evolves and how active regions uh, evolve, especially if you want to connect to space weather studies. And for that, we also need to understand the subsurface and the surface flows. For the subsurface, we need a long-term monitoring of the velocity fields, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to do a, a kind of study like that, that that Rachel showed. We need to understand these solar uh, cycle variations inside the sun to understand the dynamo. You cannot understand the dynamo without understanding the dynamics inside the sun. Dynamo has its name because of the dynamics, and therefore you need to, to monitor them, and that for a long time. So we, and to link back to these space weather studies, you need to understand the flows beneath emerging flux regions, and so that we can make progress to understand these complex uh, features on the sun. And of course, we need to want to be complementary. We will get DKIST, uh, ESD, we will see, uh, but they are microscopes, they provide important views on the sun in high detail, which we wouldn't get otherwise. But we need also the view on the large-scale effects that flares, filament, eruptions have and, uh, on the flux emergence, for example. And so in, at one of the meetings, we came up and thought about what are the science drivers for solar physics, not only for helioseismology, but for solar physics to build up a new ground-based network for synoptic observations. And this slide was done by somebody who's doing high-resolution solar physicists. So uh, it, will be a it will turn into a provocative slide, uh, but coming from a high-resolution solar physicist. 
And the question was, what, where do we need uh, synoptic observations? So what are the big questions? So one of the big questions is, how is the solar magnetic field generated, maintained, and dissipated? For that, you need a couple of uh, subtopics, which are related to what I said before. Or how are the solar corona and the solar wind maintained, and what determines their properties? So what observations do you need that, for that? Uh, what triggers transient and energetic events? And so there you need to determine the role of the interaction of interior flow and magnetic fields to establish these space weather relations. And how does solar magnetism influence their internal structure and the luminosity of the sun? So you want to also establish a relation between the sun and other stars. You want to understand how the sun influences our planetary system. For that, you want to study how other stars have implications on exoplanets. And then we came up and marked things. Where do we need synoptic observations? Where do we need high resolution observations? Where do we need both? Uh, the red ones are the ones where you need to uh, use synoptic observations. And you see it's a large fraction of, of these questions and uh, what that you, where you need uh, synoptic observations. The purple ones are the ones where you need both high resolution observations and synoptic observations, where you cannot answer the questions without having both of them. That's also a large fraction. And then we marked where do you need a high resolution solar telescope. And we came up with this one, where you need to understand the small and large, small scale effects that it, these are things that only high resolution telescopes can deliver. Of course, these are, this is an important question. It's not that the number of questions says uh, this gives a relevance. This is an important question and just, fully justifies uh, the investment done. But we also need to th think where we, need, where we could do more, and where we could do more to understand the sun, and therefore we need to complement our view on the sun. And then we try to find funding wherever possible. That was our agreement. Uh, if it is in the US, it's fine. If it is in Europe, it's fine. We go along together and try to involve each other as good as we can. And Frank and I sat to together and defined what we need. Uh, there was the opportunity to get SolarNet funded, and there we wanted to have a work package in there, and which we managed to get in. Uh, so the technical requirements that we want to fulfill are full disk Doppler velocity observations, vector magnetic fields, full disk intensity, and measurements which are relevant for space weather. That means we need to select the spectral lines and the, uh, the data products that are needed so that we provide the right wavelengths, the high, caden high right cadences, that we improve our spatial resolution, uh, that we have a, a, a good coverage in time. Uh, that means uh, that we have a good duty cycle and can provide long-term observations. And that was an international collaboration strongly led by us in Freiburg with our colleagues at NSO and HAO and also our Birmingham colleagues, uh, which had a lot of help there, the MPS, the IAC, you know all the... Uh, usual suspects in this field. Uh, we define science requirements for that. We uh, split up into four working groups dealing with synoptic magnetic fields, where NSO took the lead, transient events, where our colleagues in the Czech Republic took the lead, this on solar seismology, where Sheffield took the lead to define, and solar awareness, where Italy took over to define the requirements. We also had a lot of workshops. The first one was organized by Mike here in Boulder, the Synoptic Network Workshop in 2013. Then we had the funding from the European Union and then we could continue in Europe to think about that. And also here in Boulder, we had another meeting organized by NSO. The last one was just this year in Freiburg where we continue discussing, discussing our path. This is the science requirement document, which I'm happy to share with everybody. And this afternoon, we will continue discussing science requirements, especially for helioseismology. We have a two hours meeting here at NSO, here at HAO, uh, led by, by Frank, I think, and, and Valentin. So if your time permits, and if the room permits, please come. And so that we sit together, we have two hours, so that we really write down numbers as good as possible, what we will need for, for helioseismology. We still have time, and I think it's the right time to, to fix these requirements now. We have hopes that we improve magnetometry. So one of the ideas is that we do multi-line high resolution observations or higher resolution observations. With, so that would bring in several advantages that we get the 3D topology of active regions and the magnetic fields that we improve the coronal field extrapolations and therefore we need multi-line observations in the upper layers of the solar atmosphere. That we have the first round based continuous vector magnetometry for real time space weather predictions that we get flare-related changes in the magnetic fields, and therefore we also need uh, multi-line observations, and that we have long-term magnetic field records continue with improved uh, spatio-temporal resolution. 
coming back to helioseismology, we often think that we need multi-line, uh, higher resolution Doppler observations because we have this problem as discussed at this workshop that waves and P modes interact with the magnetic field and that they are perturbed by magnetic fields and that uh, has the problem of this helioseismic mapping of active regions and there are some studies which clearly show that high resolution observation, higher resolution observations and multi-line observation will help us in getting a better picture on these. Furthermore, multi-line observations will help us in reducing the systematic errors. Uh, and then we had a lot of multi-line height observations going on uh, in Europe, uh, which showed that how we can improve the seismic mapping also above the, the surface of the solar atmosphere. Uh, just this week, we got the announcement that one of our new papers is accepted there too. And Stuart Jeffries was one of the one exploring uh, multi-line observations and the energy transport to the solar atmosphere. And I think we, uh, we learned from them uh, how we can improve things by multi-line observations. And uh, so we had a lot of studies already going on. We have already developed tools how to combine data sets in, in Europe. So we know how we can uh, uh, reduce systematic errors by the tools we have. So we have studies. Rafa Garcia was leading one of the studies uh, that how to, to merge different data sets and how to merge different lines and different observations. And I see many ideas presented here at this conference. So we good to that you are still staying here and that we can put them uh, together. We continued with a feasibility study uh, so that we, of course, everybody came up with a wish list of instruments. So we wanted to have everything in one instrument. And so our engineers and technical people had a hard time to put that then in a, in a kind of what is feasible. And so, of course, uh, the key idea was to keep it simple. So if we would put everything in a single instrument, I, uh, we would have uh, always the challenge that it's complex and therefore it has higher costs. And the, um, the, the mean time between failures would be, would be low. So the idea is that we split it into multiple instruments into a single platform. And one of the first sketches that came up was like something like that, where we have a Solisk type instrument in front, which we have uh, remotely working uh, in automatically like Gong. So that's a kind of, of Solisk Gong merger as a first concept. Uh, there are other instruments uh, around, which we looked at, like uh, Solis, as I mentioned, which provides one, so, several of these data products which we were thinking of. Uh, also in, in Japan, is instruments like that exist, and so probably we might have to go a similar way like that. Uh, we continued looking on what could be possible uh, instruments at the front end, uh, so we came up with a uh, uh, 50 centimeter uh, telescope, uh, kind of Solis type telescope, uh, for wavelength range between 500 and 1500 nanometers. Uh, so that we cover uh, the relevant photospheric and chromospheric spectral lines for magnetic field measurements. Uh, then in the front end, we had studies going on to think about a spectral graph solution so that we get also a good uh, spectral uh, resolution for the, for the selected wavelength range. Uh, Hao Sheng Lin, Lin from Hawaii uh, tried to uh, beat the, the scanning time by uh, introducing a multiple split design, and he had a, a study on that uh, and some uh, work going on at the DST to uh, get Stokes I in helium 10 830, and I think that's a nice pathfinder study uh, for, for that. We might continue on that. Uh, for the long-term studies of flows, we came up with the idea, well, we don't need that big telescope for that. A smaller one would be fine, either a lens or also a downsized Solis for that, uh, so that we get a sensitivity of 10 uh, liters per second and therefore a 20 centimeter telescope or should, in that order should be uh, all right. Uh, to reduce complexity again we, and to have the right uh, cadence, we probably will split that into three ch uh, optical channels, blue, red, and, and infrared. And, and, con and which are identical then also in the post-focus instrumentation. For the post-focus instrumentation, we studied different filter graph concepts. One of them was a kind of uh, filter matrix which we put in if we want to have many lines. Uh, it's a fabri perot type uh, system, a dual etalon system where we can quickly scan through the line and we had some studies going on with his and NSO at, at VPT. And so we also made first full disk observations with that setup. Uh, especially by support of Sanjay and first polarimetric observations with that Sanjay Gosain from NSO, uh, which showed that such a system can run long time enough and could be stably set up. 
We thought about data processing because we want Doppler velocities, light of sight, magnetic fields, and intensities in real time. And from, uh, full Stokes inversions should then come uh, later. Uh, we thought about the location of the telescopes. At that point, we were thinking that the gong sites would be nice to have to use if the science requirements can be met there. Uh, so we looked uh, what are expected duty cycles of different networks, a study done by our colleagues in Birmingham to see how many stations we need and where could be a trade-off uh, of duty cycle and number of stations and the uh, image quality you get. If you have an excellent site, then you, uh, are, you can reach good quality or high duty cycles already with four or five stations. If you have medium sites, you, you probably better add another or two stations. And also the expected signal to noise ratio if you combine different uh, nodes. And of course, uh, as more nodes you add, as better you uh, have a duty cycle and better is your signal to noise ratio. But of course, that's also a cost driver. You need to make a trade off somewhere here. And the selection of six stations, we can confirm, as Gong did already the study many years ago, uh, is a good, uh, good choice. Uh, we looked at the duty cycles at the Gong sites as they are currently going on. Sometimes, of course, you have technical issues, but still the other cycles are, uh, uh, sites are there, which then still provide a high duty cycle of 90%. Even if one network uh, node fails, you still can uh, get the 90% uh, duty cycle. Uh, that happened through all the years where we looked at. We looked at the seeing conditions, where how we can, whether we can meet the one arc second resolution. The problem is that we have a strong dependence of the seeing at the sites and that's probably at most of the sites in the world uh, on, on time of the day and respectively, respectively on the altitude of the sun. And so we have an average seeing uh, uh, between uh, two and 10 arc seconds over all the years at all sites. But the reason here is that Gong is on the ground and has no tower. And uh, on Tenerife we know we have better seeings on the towers. So probably we will go and on a tower which is well up so that the telescope is located above the turbulent ground layer. Furthermore, Gong is integrating over one minute and we want to high, have higher cadences so we need to uh, uh, get any way out of the ground. Uh, colleagues in Andreev in Czech Republic did a cloud detection monitor for us already so that we can decide on the quality of the images. And we looked on the expected data rates and we made calculations if we have these cameras, if we take to how many wavelengths and how many spectral points and full Stokes vector and cadences, we came up with seven ter terabytes per day, which we produce at one of the sites. And that means if we compress it and have the duty cycle of 65%, we have 4.5 terabytes of compressed raw data per day inside, which is not impossible to process and transport. Uh, we now continue, that's the current part where we are, on a preliminary design study, which is also funded by EU money, also in collaboration with our colleagues here in the United States, uh, to address also these four key science questions. And we have split our work into three work packages. We think about design of the mounting and the telescopes, very general. We still can adjust the science requirements, but we will make plans so that we, in the end, when we fine tune thing, things in a detailed design study, have already a, a, a draft where to start with. So that we have the parameter space defined in which we can uh, move. And in that way, we will also design and prototype instrumentation. And we have started to define the first data processing pipelines and the, the imaging capturing. So what are the future plans? Well, we think spring will be an international effort. And that's where, how we started and that's how we want to continue. It is currently an activity jointly led by our colleagues in the US and, and in Europe. And I know there's a worldwide interest in the concept. And it's now the time to agree on the science requirements because there are further chances to get funding ahead. So we need to make up our minds what we need. And therefore, it's a good opportunity that we stay together in this afternoon so that we can adjust our preliminary design and then carry out a detailed design study before we start prototyping the post-focus instrumentation. So let me summarize. We have several science questions in solar physics, including helioseismology, that require new instrumentation. The suggested concept is spring, or NG Gong. Uh, we will find a name for that in the end. It's a multi-platform, probably, carrying several instruments. One possible way to go is that we have split also the telescope, the larger telescope for magnetic fields, and the smaller telescopes for Doppler velocities. I think that the, will come out of this independently of what science requirements we will uh, bring up. The instruments, there's development of technical concepts are on the way and need to be brought on the way. The data rates are high, but not impossible to handle. And so we are looking to continue the discussions so that we can continue the path we are on.
Thank you. Thank you, Marcus, very much for, for all the effort in getting this going. So we have plenty of time for questions. Yes, Paul? Just a few sort of more or less random comments along the way. Um, one new thing is that we actually now again can get uh, lithium nitrate etalons that work to spec that you would want. So we found someone who can make them. It may be interesting from what you're doing. But that, okay, I'll try it louder. I'm saying that actually we, we have now got lithium niobate etalons mm -hmm. that actually work to the specs you want that have been manufactured in, in hand. Mm -hmm. uh, so that may be an interesting thing to do. Yes, About the definitely. sites around the world, um, we call it the gong sites. Some places were deselected due to political reasons that no longer may apply. So I think it may be worth just taking a little bit look at, at that. Uh, but I was just sort of to, to write no comments. So I guess we'll discuss this afternoon. Yeah, well, the gong sites, as I said, depending on the science requirements that we define, we will have to look at, look, look at those. I mean, it's yeah. not clear that they are really ideal for the concept here, but they, they were selected for other reasons yes, a very, very yes, long yes, time yes, ago, yes. so just be a little yeah. careful with yeah, that. Yeah, of yeah. course, we need to have a thinking on them. Yes, please. Oh. Thanks, Marcus. Uh, I'm totally fine with you putting there a spring equal NG gone. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Uh, but my question is more about a spring, and uh, I'm saying I'm totally fine. I'm not saying it's true or it's false. I'm saying I'm totally fine. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Uh, my question is about the spring, which is more the European-led part, yeah. where, yes, H.A. Johan and S.O. are part of it. Uh, but the question is, how do you see this becoming a reality in Europe? Because the European Union will put money for the definition, for study phases, but if you want to get it built, yes. you have to do something else in Europe, similar to what EST is doing. We, and then I'm currently learning. Like, how yeah, how like becoming done. some legal entity and then getting funding from the member states. Yes. So how far or how close are you from, from actually getting some uh, money for construction in Europe? I'm uh, well, we are, uh, currently we are, I would say we are at the position where EST was in maybe 2009 or 2008. So we, we are on the path, we got support from the uh, EU to bring, up, to bring the EU community together to think about what would be a worldwide interest, what would be a worldwide effort. We got some money to get uh, some first studies done, little money, not big money, so, but we could uh, think about concepts. And now the next step is that we, we have the chance to write a proposal to be submitted in November to get funding for full design study, which includes everything, site testing, technical concepts, data processing, building the international partnership we need. Uh, still, it's little money, <laughs> but uh, it's something we can apply for. And the next step then is if we have then a, a detailed design, we would have to go to the individual funding agencies in Europe. EU will never build a big infrastructure. EU will never provide the money to build an infrastructure. They will only provide money for prototyping at the end. So we could, might get also get money for prototyping from the EU. But in the end, we will be in the same process as EST is now, to get around, uh, ringing doorbells everywhere and asking, do we have a little bit of money for, for our uh, instrument? The, uh, but we have Scott first. Sorry, sorry, Sasha. It's okay? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I think what Valentin just said is very important. You know that even that EST is in the S3, you know, the uh, big infrastructure. It's not even funded. I know the German are pushing, but I can tell you that in France there is no support for EST. Sure. It's extremely difficult. So we are not even sure we can do EST right now. And the situation is extremely de delicate right now to fund this in Europe. So I'm saying if we end up in a situation where we say it's either spring or EST, what will the community do in Europe? I'm speaking. I'm not speaking in the US. They have decayed already, so they can move on, you know. But we don't even have EST. So I'm not saying this is not important, but I'm saying even having EST in S3, we are not even sure to get it funded, and you are not even in S3. So it's uh, 10 years uh, timeline, perhaps. And what is the timeline of the project? Uh, what was the expectation to have it in a few years' time? It seems almost yep. impossible. Well, so I'm not, I don't want to be 
cold field here. I'm just saying uh, the reality right now is very complex in, in Europe. Yep. Whether we will make an approach to get NG Gong Spring on the S3 roadmap, I'm not sure whether we in that ball ballpark of instruments uh, in terms of size and cost. Uh, uh, I wrote, a, I was in part of the authors who wrote the S3 application for ESP. So uh, I know what it is needed to, to get there. And I have the contacts to the S3 de uh, delegates in, in Europe. Uh, I'm also involved in getting the proposals written to the national funding agencies. And we got a response for the, our ESP application in Germany uh, two weeks ago. So, and we have there, the, the comment is that ESP is not currently uh, in the status to be directly funded. So we need to continue with further design studies for ESP. That's more or less the uh, answer we got and to, to be clear on the cost and to be clear on the technical concepts. So, uh, but that was a, the roadmap process is for, pro, for uh, projects which have funding above the, in, in Germany above the 50 million uh, euro line as, kind of as, as share. So ESP is a cost of 200 million euro and I'm not sure whether spring will be that expensive. So our cost estimates are that we are Clearly below 200 million euros, and so more in the, okay, the 60 Marcus, to 100. Can, can, can we but go to the let's go to Sorry, discuss more the, the, not the European side here, but uh, discuss here yeah, what we want to have from our American colleagues. Time, but there's three points. So back to Sasha's point that 10 years may not be bad because I think one of the issues you're going to have, I understand the need for infrastructure and infrastructure protection from the concept of space web, right? So there's a clear need. I think the problem, the underlying problem, is we're going through research agencies to try and get these things funded, not operational agencies. And so a very clear and compelling science case is required. Is that there? That's my big question. But furthermore, as the director of HAO, I have a mandatory question to ask about chronographs. Yes. And so chronographic science, and especially with advanced Doppler chronographic technology and spectral polarimetry, yeah add significant um, texture to the science. Yeah. And so, you know, the, I always used to joke with Doves, if Doves in the room, that, you know, what we see in the chromosphere and the corona is the interior's loss, literally, but somehow it's a coupled system. And so how, you know, I think there's a lot to be said by coupling chronographic type mm -hmm. methodologies yeah. and wave analysis and all these things into what's been spent 20, 30 years dealing with the interior to look at the sun as a system. And so, so for, for beyond just space weather applications of chronographs, there's lots of other very yeah. novel, yeah. eye-opening things that you can do. So yeah. That was more of a, a question. But the science case, I think, is a, a puzzler. Yeah. Well, I think we have made, in Europe, a lot of thinking about the science cases, and we have collected a lot of scientific questions which I think are worth the, the investment. And I think we have the big questions in solar physics, and they can only be answered by such a kind of network, which integrates a large fraction of solar physics. And that includes also the coronagraphs. If it means that we have to go to other sites and change, our spe and, and change the science requirements we have so far, I'm happy with doing that. So the name of it is Spring Solar Physics Research Integrated Network Group. So we want to integrate solar physics in this. A name uh, defined by, by Frank here, who came up with the, the name and the acronym. So uh, I think we want to integrate solar physics to get a, a better and a, a deeper understanding of what is going on inside and uh, the sun and also in the outer layers. Yeah. Thank you very much, Markus. So. Want to now know the future in astro seismology from Dan Newber? Okay, so we're going to switch to the future of astro seismology now. As many others uh, before, uh, it's an honor to be up here and to speak at this workshop in honor of uh, Michael Thompson. 
Uh, I would not be up here today and to tell you about all these exciting results from Master's Seismology if it wouldn't be for pioneers like Michael and many others, of course, that are in the room that paved the way for the success of Master's Seismology. And I've thought about ways to sort of illustrate, uh, in a way, the legacy of, of, of Michael and others and to the uh, Astro Seismology community. And so I thought I showed these pictures. Um, they might have been shown on the first day, which I unfortunately had to miss. But these are uh, various pictures from uh, Kepler and TESS Astro Seismic Science Consortium meetings over the years, which have now been going on for over 10 years, I think. Um, and a couple of things I want you to take away from these pictures is, one, is that the community, the Astro Seismology community, has really grown. Uh, thanks to Kepler and all the uh, amazing astro seismology results. And also the second part is that the large fraction of our community are now junior scientists that have, there's essentially a whole generation that partially includes me that has done astro seismic science solely with space-based data uh, from Kepler. So one of these pictures, in fact, the one on the top right was uh, the CASC meeting here in Boulder. That picture you might uh, uh, be familiar, was just taken outside here. Um, and another one, uh, the most recent meeting uh, in Aarhus, uh, where uh, Michael uh, was also attending. So I think uh, the pictures of this astro seismology community sort of illustrate uh, the legacy of Michael uh, and his, uh, his impact on uh, astro seismology. So I'm going to start off with uh, talking not about the future, but talking a little bit about the past um, and how we got to where we are today on the hunt of solar-like oscillations, oscillations in other stars than the sun. Of course, with the success of helio seismology, it was realized that it would be really great to perform uh, seismology in other stars, and there were lots of efforts. Uh, the very first uh, effort now in hindsight that was successful in detecting oscillations in another star than the sun was in Procyon, but Tim Brown was in the audience. Uh, but there were many others, Ida Bu, Alpha Cene, Beta Hydrae, very bright stars, all observed using ground-based radio velocity measurements. And you can see them here, and of course, these were successful, but one of the big problems was that the data was taken from the ground, and so there, was gaps, there were gaps in the data, caused aliasing, and hence the mode identification uh, was very difficult. So it was quickly realized that uh, going into space, of course, would solve this problem, but there were challenges. Um, the first attempts, or some of the first attempts using the most space telescope yielded a null detection in Procyon, and that yielded a flurry of papers about why uh, Procyon might not be oscillating, and whether the non-detection uh, from most is actually consistent with the rate of velocity data. And it took a few years, but after a few years, I think we came to the consensus that Procyon is, in fact, oscillating. And in fact, we see the oscillations of Procyon both in most data and in rate of velocity data. So these, this plot here on the right shows the latest most run and the rate of velocity data showing the power excess at the same frequency. And so at about 2009, where we're at a stage, if you looked at an HR diagram and you showed all the stars where we have astro seismic detections, we had about a dozen dwarfs and about a dozen giants where we had detections of solar-like oscillations. Of course, after this followed uh, the kickoff of the space-based uh, revolution of astro seismology through Corot. Corot delivered the very first high signal to noise detections in dwarfs, the famous HD49933, shown here in the top right. And it delivered thousands of detections of oscillations in red giants, which showed us for the very first time, conclusively, that red giants oscillate in non-radial radio modes. And that opened up the field of astro seismology to some of the very exciting results on red giants that we heard about yesterday. And then, of course, the final step was Kepler. And Kepler completely filled up the HR diagram, going from stars that are cooler than the sun to subgiants all the way up to the red giant branch with detections of extremely high signal-to-noise, such as 16 sig A. We already saw uh, some of this yesterday, where the signal-to-noise essentially rivals uh, the integrated uh, light curves that we get from the sun. So Kepler is the status as to essentially how things are now. And there's still a lot of work being performed, of course, with Kepler data. And we heard that yesterday. There's still a lot more work to do. But currently, there's another fire hose of data that we're trying to manage uh, and trying to ingest. And that, of course, comes from the next NASA mission, TESS. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to tell you a little bit about the first results coming down uh, on solar-like oscillators from TESS. So TESS has been observing for about a year now. So we have uh, plenty of data already to work with. And I'll show you some of the first results uh, that we get. So just like um, uh, Kepler, TESS also has a dedicated short cadence mode for uh, performing astro seismology. So our community did a lot of work of selecting the targets that we wanted to have observed in two-minute cadence uh, to perform astro seismology. This is an HR diagram 
showing a selection of these stars that we selected for tests to observe in fast cadence. There are a couple of uh, structures in this diagram that might look a little bit strange, so I'll just ex explain them briefly. Of course, the hot edge, so the reason why there's an edge here is because we want to exclude the classical pulsators, delta scuti stars. We're interested in stars with convective envelopes. We don't include uh, red giants on two-minute cadence because they can just be observed in the regular full-frame image cadence, so that's the entire sky the test is observing in 30 minutes. And then down here in the bottom right towards the sun, there are almost no stars that were proposed because we knew that it would be very hard to detect the signal because we have stars of small amplitudes, the test is a smaller telescope, and hence it was not expected that we'd be particularly successful to detect oscillations there. So we've now analyzed about six, seven months worth of data coming down from tests. So these were the gray ones were the ones that we proposed. Here in red and blue are highlighted detections that we have made. This is preliminary analysis that we have done over the summer. The red ones are solid detections. Blue ones are the ones where we still need to look into. The bottom line conclusion is that about 50% of all the targets that we proposed show definite uh, oscillations in the data. There's a good reason why that number is 50%, not 100%. I won't talk about this uh, right now, but feel free to ask me about it uh, afterwards. I will instead talk about the detections. Uh, so here are a few examples of various power spectra of stars living in different parameter spaces. Of course, as you might expect, we're doing really well in the subgiants, so just at the base of the RGB, we get very high signal-to-noise detections, but also as you march to higher and higher frequencies, which is equivalent to essentially marching further down uh, on this HR diagram, we get beautiful detections. And so there's a lot of data that TESS is already giving us uh, ready for a detailed analysis. So I will now uh, talk about a few individual examples of where we've already uh, made some progress and published papers. The first one is, in fact, an exoplanet host star. So I'll talk a little bit about exoplanets, or the slimy rocks, as Jürgen likes to call them. Call them, call That's them. Okay. That's okay. That's okay. Detection that we have made uh, was in TY197. TY stands for test object of interest. It's a designation, it's a designation that candidates get. Um, and this star also lives right up here. So it's a very evolved subgiant. Um, a remarkable thing about TOI 187 is not just the system, but also the amount of offers that are on the paper. So there's about 140 offer, co-offers off, uh, offers on this paper. There's a reason for this. And the reason is that this paper and the analysis of this system required the expertise of two communities, the astroseismology community and the exoplanet community working together. And I think offer lists like that are an example that uh, these co two communities have grown uh, closer together in the era of uh, Kepler and Tess. So here is the light curve of TUI-187. TESS observes 27-day-long sectors. So this target has a 27-day-long light curve with a downlink gap in the middle. And you can quite clearly see, just by eye, the transits, one of them here, one of them here, spaced by a period of 14.3 days. Now, if you take the Fourier transform of your light curve, of course, you get a power spectrum that shows the detection of oscillations. So the star oscillates at about 400 microhertz, clearly um, a subgiant. And you can also see that the regular spacing, there is regular spacing, but it's not quite as clear as in the sun. And that's, of course, the signature of the mixed modes, which we expect to find uh, in subgiants and more evolved stars. We then performed our typical analysis. We extracted frequencies and we modeled those frequencies. So what's shown on the left here is in the shell diagram. Uh, in gray are the extracted frequencies. So we detected both uh, radial and non-radial modes, L equals one and L equals two modes. You can clearly see the L equals one modes here in red, these three and the one on the right are clearly uh, mixed, and so they don't follow the regular spacings as the radial modes do. The open symbols show the model that we fitted to the data. It was actually quite surprising and remarkable that we did find a model that fitted quite well given the limited amount of frequency information that we had. Um, but given that, uh, we were able to constrain, of course, the radius, the mass, and the age of the star to quite high precision. Of course, the second part of this system is the planets. So we also performed uh, uh, analysis of the transit light curve. So the top right here shows the phase folded transit light curve from TESS. We performed radio velocity follow-up observations from the ground, which confirmed the planetary nature and which phase up uh, with uh, the orbit of the planet. And combining all these pieces, the characterization of the whole star, the precise mass and radius with the transit, we've got the radius of the planet and with the radio velocity data, the mass. And that means that we were able to put it on a planet radius mass diagram. And it turns out that TUI 197 is actually fairly similar in its properties as Saturn. So Saturn lives right here in a radius, planet radius versus mass diagram. Saturn is up here, and TUI 197 is a close analog 
uh, to Saturn, of course, only in its mass and radius. The incident flux is much, much closer in, of course, because over the period of 14.3 days. The point I want to make on this diagram, and there's much to discuss, are the precision with which we determine the radius of the planet, the mass, and the density. The 15%, which is really quite extraordinary in uh, retrospect of many other planets that we know of, this plot shows all planets with densities known to be better than 50%. So one of the goals that we have is to really map out this mass-radius relation, which, as you can see, changes quite significantly going from Earth's to Neptune's to Saturn's and Jupiter's across this parameter space with other examples of planets orbiting astro-seismic stars. Okay, the second example I want to show of a test uh, detection, an astro-seismology application, is Mu Indy, also a star that lives at the base of the RGB. It's a subgiant. Mu Indy is a bit of an... Um, call it an astro-seismic celebrity. The, co the reason why I call it like that is because we actually had a detection of this star from the ground using radio velocities, a paper led by Tim Bedding in 2006. It was a multi-site campaign, so you had two sites obtaining radio velocity measurements. Um, and these uh, data yielded a detection, which was quite convincing. So this is the power spectrum uh, using the radio velocity time series, and you can clearly see a power axis. But you can also see that the spectral window is not that clean, and that, of course, means that there was some ambiguity in actually doing mode identification and extracting the frequencies and then modeling the frequencies, which wasn't actually done using this data set because of the ambiguity. We now have tests, data of the same system, and this is how the power spectrum looks like of New Indy as seen by tests. So I'll flip back and forth between those two a couple of times, and you can very clearly see that we improve the mode identification. You see that the peaks are narrower. That's just because it's a longer uh, time baseline. And you can also see that the spectral window is essentially completely clean. And so there's no ambiguity in terms of which peaks are real. So we've modeled New Indy. The science application here is that this is an ancient star. It's metal poor. It's a benchmark star in the solar neighborhood. And using the age constraint, we're actually able to place uh, some valuable age constraints on uh, uh, merging events in the Milky Way. So essentially constraining some of the Milky Way uh, formation history by age dating one star uh, very uh, uh, precisely. Okay, now finally, you might ask yourself, well, where are all the detections down, lower down on the main sequence? So I've shown you mostly detections up here. Is there any hope of detecting uh, oscillations in stars that are more similar to the sun? I said initially that we were quite pessimistic about this, but it turns out that there are actually detections uh, in stars similar to the sun already in this first data set. This is courtesy of Ashley Chantos, one of my graduate students at the IFA in Warwick Hall uh, at the University of Birmingham. It went through the data and dedicatedly looked at those uh, uh, stars that are closer down the main sequence and found a few detections. One that I want to highlight that we're particularly excited about right now is Alpha Mense. Um, Alpha Men is cooler than the sun, which was quite exciting that we were actually able to do uh, astroseismology in a star later type than the sun. Here's the power spectrum. So the top left shows a log-log power spectrum, which sort of shows the, gran the typical granulation background. And then on top of that, uh, the oscillations here. And the, top, uh, the bottom panel just shows uh, the uh, zoom in on the um, power axis where we detected it. The signal to noise is not great. This is a star that has been observed continuously for uh, 12 sectors. But still, it's clearly enough to extract the large frequency separations. So this is an autocorrelation of the power axis. And even uh, construct in the shell diagram where we see uh, both radial, dipole, and quadrupole modes. This is the brightest star for which we have detected uh, modes from space uh, with a new max that's greater than the new max of the sun with a higher oscillation frequency. There's another thing that's quite interesting about the system. It has a companion, an M dwarf companion, that's physically bound at about 30 AU. So there's some exciting prospects of using the system as a benchmark for gyrochronology. If you can age date the primary, which we can clearly can because we have the astroseismology, we age date automatically the M dwarf. So if we can measure the rotation period of the M dwarf, that has some uh, very exciting implications for gyrochronology relations. Okay, so this was the update on tests. And uh, to, to wrap this up, I just want to bring the test detections and put them into perspective of what we've known before. Uh, so this is a diagram that shows astroseismic detections in stellar radius, so the radius of the star versus the distance of the star from us. And the symbol size is scaled with the apparent magnitude of the star. And of course, these detections, the ground-based ones, the ones I've shown before, prior to 2009, mostly have stars that are very close to us and that are very bright, Alpha Cn A, Alpha Cn B, Tau Ceti, Procyon, and so on. Kepler was extremely good in filling up the parameter space of giving us detections of stars that are solar-like, so you know, 
solar radius and a little bit larger. But the problem was that the Kepler stars were actually quite faint and actually quite far away. So a lot of these are quite faint stars that are hundreds of parsecs, and hence getting independent information on the star that helps with the modeling of the astroseismic frequencies, for example, from interferometry or even parallaxes, at least before Gaia, has been quite challenging. And so the test sample, if you overplot the test sample, the preliminary detections that I've shown you before, actually fits very neatly in a unique parameter space in this diagram. TESS is predominantly detecting oscillations in subgiants that are closer in and much brighter, so we have a lot more possibilities of follow-up observations, but also extends down to these really nearby solar-type stars. So Alpha Mensa here uh, is this star highlighted. And of course, there will be some overlap. Some of these green circles will turn into red circles, and we actually have radio velocity data from the ground and space-based data uh, from TESS. Okay, so that was the update from tests. So it's looking very good. We have lots and lots of data to work with. Um, so the fire hose is quite literally on again uh, after Kepler, and we have uh, lots of data to catch up with. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk about the switch gears a little bit and talk about the future, so the far future of what comes after tests. Um, and to do this, I'm going to uh, guide you with this plot, uh, which I made for uh, an Astro, the Astro 2020 Decadal Review that shows the number of solar-like oscillators that we know as a function of time for red giants in red and for dwarfs and subgiants in blue. And you can already see, just looking at the y-axis and realizing that this spans six orders of magnitude, that uh, we're doing pretty well, and we have done pretty well in the past, and it's really been a revolution in terms of just sheer numbers of detections. So with tests, we're currently up here. We expect to break about a million red giants with tests just from the full-frame image data. Um, from the dwarfs and subgiants, we may reach 10,000 uh, with the extended mission. It's probably going to be a bit less, but uh, order of magnitude is about right. Um, and of course, what's going on after tests are uh, at least two missions that we already know have uh, potential for astroseismology. The first one is, of course, Plato. Um, there are many people in the room who can say a lot more uh, about Plato and a lot better than I can. Um, but Plato, of course, will uh, extend uh, Kepler both by just the footprint on the sky, so the field of view is much larger. We will revisit the Kepler field, observe more stars, and actually have a dedicated synergy of astroseismology and exoplanet science, which is really quite exciting. In the Kepler days, it was exoplanets first, and then you know, the astroseismology was sort of a, a great add-on. But for Plato, that's really one of the key science cases, and that's very exciting. We expect to detect something between 20 to 80,000 uh, seismic detections in dwarfs only, which is really uh, an order of magnitude uh, increase over uh, what we'll have uh, with tests. Another mission that I wanted to bring up, which might not be on, on, on many people's mind in terms of an astroseismology uh, telescope, is WFIRST, the Wide Field Infrared uh, Survey Telescope from NASA, uh, which was the top-ranked mission in the last decadal survey. Uh, so WFIRST is essentially a very wide field uh, instrument um, in the infrared. So you see here the footprint of WFIRST uh, compared to HST cameras and also JWST. So just an extremely wide field of view, uh, built, of course, to address a wide range of science goals. But one of the science goals that WFIRST will pursue is a microlensing survey in the galactic bulge. And to do this, uh, WFIRST will obtain light curves for 75 days, multiples uh, hundreds of days, in the H band with 15 minute cadence to detect microlensing events and detect planets through microlensing events. And so, just like we've used the Kepler data where we had transits for astroseismology, we can actually use the W first H band light curves in the bulge for astroseismology. So, to show this, uh, this is um, from a paper um, from a paper Andy Gould and I wrote uh, quite some time ago now, where we actually took Kepler data and sim, and sim W first might see. So, this is a red giant as observed by Kepler, by a red clump star, new max of about 30. And if you degrade the Kepler light curve to what W first will see, so you take into account the gaps in data, how long it will observe, the cadence, the photometric position, you can clearly see that we still get a very clear detection in the W first data. So W first will be able to perform, to detect oscillations down to about the red clump, clump add up all uh, the red clump detections, you get about a million stars that are in the, in the, in the, in the bulge. There will, there will be a lot of data to work with uh, from WFIRST, mostly red giants. It will not be good for dwarfs and subgiants, but this will also be a very large data set uh, to handle. Okay, so what about even further in the future? Of course, ideally, we would love these trends to just continue up uh, this way. Of course, that's probably not actually what's going to happen, uh, but I'll, I'll tell you about some thoughts uh, from my perspective, what are 
future resources for astroseismology. And one of, one of those resources, which I'm quite excited about, uh, are actually ground-based transient surveys. So right now, there's a lot of investment in surveys that scan the entire sky once a night or even multiple times a night. And I've listed some of them here, Atlas, LSST, Assassin, CTF. They have various different science cases. Most of them are to detect supernova, tidal disruption events, things that essentially explode uh, in the night sky and change very rapidly. Atlas is a, a based in Hawaii that's actually built to detect killer asteroids, so very fast moving uh, asteroids in our solar system. But all of these give us time domain data. Of course, the time domain data that these telescopes give us are not comparable in terms of precision and cadence to what we get from space. But if we look at the right stars, they will be useful. Very evolved giants, for example. So here's a light curve of a Kepler star that's near the tip of the RGB. And you see four years of continuous data with beautiful uh, oscillations. And on the right-hand side, the power spectrum of this star. Now here's the light curve and the power spectrum of the same star as observed with Assassin and Atlas, two of those surveys that I've mentioned before. And you can clearly see, first of all, that the time baseline that these surveys have is already comparable to Kepler, and that we uh, uh, basically recover the same signal that we see in Kepler in these surveys. And these surveys will go on for a very long time. They haven't stopped, of course. And you can actually apply this to many Kepler systems, and one of my students, Connor Augie, is currently writing a paper demonstrating that this can, in fact, work um, to about uh, frequencies of about a microhertz or two. So that means that you, you might think, okay, M giants are complicated. We can't learn really anything about the interior structure of M giants from these few modes. But the science case is really more about mapping out the galaxy and being able to derive distances from M giants just from the fact that we know at which uh, periods they're oscillating through essentially period luminosity relations. So this is a, uh, an illust illustration of this. I'll go for this a bit quicker. Um, so the Gaia, this is a simulation of our Milky Way. Gaia gives us distances in this area here. I'll tell you about three kiloparsecs. So not very far, just because the parallax has become very small. But astroseismology can give us distances much further than this. And that's because the astroseismic distances, the detectability just relies on the luminosity of the star. So we can get 10% distances. This is not new, in fact. We've done this with using Ogo and Macho and other uh, time series in the bulge. But these, uh, these surveys now cover the entire sky and hence we can extend this uh, to the entire Milky Way. Okay, so for giants, we have these ground-based surveys. What about the dwarfs? Um, and I'll, uh, there's many possibilities, of course, and maybe some of these we'll discuss this afternoon. One of the challenges I think that I'm particularly excited about and sort of a new frontier, as I see it, is to push astroseismology to cool dwarfs. And by cool dwarfs, I mean stars that are cooler than the sun, K dwarfs, and perhaps even M dwarfs someday. So these are, uh, this is a lower, an h diagram of the lower main sequence showing all detections that we have right now. And I'm sort of split off the spectral types here. And, and we only have currently two bona fide K dwarfs where we have detected astroseismic signals. One is Alpha Cent B and one is Kepler 444. And so the question is how do we increase the number of detections in this parameter space? Now there are it probably won't be photometry, and as others have mentioned, the signal to noise or the noise from the granulation is much lower in velocity. So we need to do it in velocity, and there's sort of two options to do this. One is that you just get a very large telescope and make use of one of these high precision rate of velocity spectrographs that are built for exoplanet science, and observe stars with very high cadence. So you need essentially a very fast redo and just hammer the star as fast as you can to beat down the noise. Or option two, if you don't have a lot of, it will still require a lot of time, even on eight meter class telescopes. If you don't have that option, then another option is to just observe for a very long time with a network of smaller telescopes. And of course, one of these networks, possible networks, uh, is the Song Network. So building a true network of Song nodes around the world where we can get continuous coverage and get precision rate of velocities might open up the possibility of doing astroseismology of K-dwarfs. I've shown I'm showing here a, a, um, a simulation that demonstrates this, that this is possible in principle. So this is a simulation of a K-dwarf oscillation spectrum at about 4,000 microhertz. So this is pure signal without noise. And if you add in the noise as expected and you simulate a six months of observing campaign with an 80% due to cycle, one minute cadence, and four meters per second RV precision, uh, which has been demonstrated on a star similar like this, you get a power spectrum like this. Again, the signal to noise is not great, but you have a detection. And there are lots of problems in interior models of K and M dwarfs that could be tackled or at least helped with just the detection of, for example, the large and the small frequency separation. 
Okay, so um, so this is essentially one alternative to this song uh, or other ground-based graded velocity machines that perhaps will help uh, with pushing astroseismology into the future of uh, lower mass cooler stars. There are other concepts. Um, so in the call for the ESA Voyage 2050 long-term plan, there are two white papers which are fascinating to read uh, from Andrea Miglio and Eric Michel on two concept missions where astroseismology might be able to go in the future, one of which uh, sort of targets more uh, essentially a dedicated mission to do astroseismology in clusters, and the other one more of a follow-up of uh, red giant and galactic archaeology following up on the results that we've gotten from Gaia. Okay, so with this, I'll put up my conclusions, uh, and I'm leaving it up there. Um, but in general, I think the conclusion I hopefully convinced you that the future of astroseismology is very bright, and we will have our hands full for many more years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, very much. A bright future, indeed. Thank you. So questions, comments, please? Very, very nice review. Um, one of the disappointing things that you pointed out with TESS is that lower right-hand part of the HR diagram is not really being sampled very well. And of course, it's because the cadence is, is too long. Um, there has been some discussion in the extended TESS mission of going to a third of a minute cadence down from the two minute cadence, which is their fastest right now. Um, would that open up that sector in the HR diagram, or is, it, or is there signal to noise considerations that would, would prevent? Oh, absolutely, yes. So, so, um, so there are considerations of a 20 second cadence with tests in the extended mission. We're currently looking into this, uh, but it's feasible, but my prediction is that hopefully it will happen. And it will have uh, an advantage. So if I go back to um, Alpha Mense, for example. So Alpha Men, the Nyquist frequency of the current cadence that's being used, two-minute cadence, is 4,000 microhertz. So I don't know if I can use my cursor. But anyway. So 4,000 microhertz is just here. So it's essentially just to the higher, just where the oscillations are. And essentially what happens if you sample too close to the Nyquist frequency is that you get amplitude dilution. And so, in other words, if Alpha Mense would have been observed in 20-second cadence, this power spectrum would look a lot better. And so other stars that we may be able to observe, um, and there may be more, that if we actually put them on with 20-second cadence, then the detection probability would look a lot better. Um, it won't be you know, a huge amount. This is a fifth magnitude star, so they still have to be pretty bright. But it's still, it, it will certainly be more than um, what we would expect with two-minute cadence. So that's something to look forward to, for sure. Yes, Yvonne, please. Okay, all very, very pretty. Can we go to the picture that showed the number of stars? Um, the other thing that I'd really have liked to have seen on this is some concept of the data duration, because as someone who enjoys looking at red giants and looking at G modes, I need long spectra. Um, and therefore, it would be interesting to see this kind of thing is Kepler all I'm going to get, and then possibly Plato, or is there, uh, you know, where are the options? I think that's another way you need to actually describe the future. Yeah, so perhaps, I mean, this, this, you're absolutely right. So this graph only says we can detect something, right? We can detect the oscillations to a certain degree. And essentially, what we mean by that is that we can measure the frequency of maximum power in the large separation. Um, but you're right, of course, a, a lot of the um, future data sets, including tests, because it's only 27 days for lots of red giants, uh, won't be able, won't, won't allow the sort of detailed analysis that we we're used to from Kepler from four years of data. I think Plato, of course, will address some of this. Um, w first, perhaps too. So this will be hundreds of days. So it's currently, I think it's sort of like two, three hundred days of data. And so if you take into account, I think that for red giants, there will be an exciting data set to actually do detailed mode analysis and detect rotational splittings. Of course, the ground-based transient survey uh, that I've service that I've mentioned, those will not be able to give us that quality. But you're right. I mean, perhaps we need to think of, uh, you know, a y-axis quantity that takes into account not just the detection, but the length of the data set, some figure of merit that might uh, put these missions into, into perspective. But this is purely just the number of uh, the data that will be available. Yeah, please. Th that, of course, is a very important point that Ivan raised. And in connection with, with TESS, we should remember that technically, it looks like TESS could be operating for decades. 
And so there is an option if, if we, we can convince the uh, mission to have a, a, an extended period with very long-term observations of a, a single field in the sky. And that, that's something we should think very carefully about and, and to see whether the scientific uh, case for that would be strong enough. Uh, the second point is that in the, the next uh, extended phase, the full frame image rate is going down to 10 minutes, and mean, that means we're going to get an awful lot of subgiants. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So the, the current strategy for testing the extend mission is essentially to revisit the field, so it's going to go back to the ecliptic uh, southern hemisphere and then the northern hemisphere. But as Jorgen mentioned, if our community feels very strongly about it, and we will probably have to sort of fight against the exoplanet community in some ways, that we could just make tests there. Uh, just like Kepler did for a very, very long time, and then we'll be able to uh, perhaps get this long baseline for better frequency resolution and build detailed studies. But just to get back to, to Yvonne's point, there is, there is merit, of course, in numbers rather than just the, you know, the detailed analysis, and that's galactic archaeology. I mean, that's the main science driver of galactic archaeology is to sample different solar populations and just getting a mass and an age of a red giant through you know, a, a detection that's perhaps not that high signal to noise and that allows that detailed analysis. Um, is still valuable. So there are different science cases that benefit from both, but I agree that both, both are important to keep in mind. One last comment, question? So let's thank Dan again. And so we move on to the next speaker, Don Kurtz, that will tell us about the old paper. It's on there, Steve. It's in your directory somewhere. Yeah, we do. Oh, I'll, I'll just stand here. Okay, good morning, everyone. Yesterday, Margarita told us that she never collaborated scientifically with Michael Thompson. And you'll see on the screen right now a contradiction to that. And I have to say, for me, the same is true. Michael and I didn't work together scientifically, except on this paper led by Margarita. So we're in the same boat for that, Margarita. Um, but Michael and I interacted a great deal in discussion and, of course, as friends. And we see, keep seeing that lovely picture of Michael smiling out at us, which comes off the website. But I have others of those. For example, at the Porto meeting, some years ago, there's Michael with Roseanne Goff, for those of you who don't know the other people, Sylvie Beauclair and Berta Christensen-Dalsgore. This is from a meeting in Sheffield. This is 2006, anybody remind me? No, later than that. A Sheffield meeting where we were dining with Michael and Kate and Robin at their house, which they were caretaking for the National Trust of England in the Longshaw Estate. And you will see, if you look around that picture, that almost everybody in that picture is here in the room, with only a couple of exceptions. And of course, Michael and Kate and Robin and I did like to walk together. This is a long time ago, as you'll recognize from Robin's talk on Tuesday. He was drastically younger. The two golden retrievers are the children of my wife and me. And you'll see that Robin and the dogs hit it off very well. I think he would have liked to have adopted the dogs on that day. So, We've had decades of companionship that came about through science rather than direct scientific collaboration. I'm sure that's true of many of you with the other people in this room too. The scientific topic today is to look at something quite different from what we've been talking about the last couple days. We're going to look up the main sequence to the A and F stars and look at some new challenges that the test data have brought about for um, ideas that we've had for the last 40 years Maybe they're right, maybe they're not. Let's look at the challenges. It comes from the rapidly oscillating AP stars, which I discovered about 40 years ago. They're strongly magnetic stars, magnetic fields, global fields of tens of kilogauss in many cases. So compare that to your global field in the sun or your field in sunspots. Pulsation periods of now just a few minutes up to a little over 20 minutes. Photometric amplitudes in the blue where the um, peak is of the spectral energy distribution can be about 10 thousandths, 10 parts per thousand, 10 millimags. Photometric amplitude in tests, which is in the red, substantially lower, about a sixth of that, but of course with excellent signal to noise because it's space data. 
Radio velocities can get to be very large, up to many kilometers per second, even though these are very small oscillations. And that comes about for reasons I'm going to show you in a moment, um, because we can look so high in the atmosphere. The two diagrams I put on there, one of them is to illustrate that these stars have got pulsation axes which are not the rotation axis. Up until the discovery of these stars, we simply assumed that all pulsating stars pulsated with a pulsation axis about the rotation axis because that seems like that's the major distortion from spherical symmetry in stars. But with the strong magnetic fields in these stars, the major distortion is the magnetic field. The pulsation axis is near to the magnetic axis. And so in this diagram, it's showing you that the pulsation will rotate with respect to your view, and you get to walk around the mode and look at it from different directions. And that's a fantastic piece of information for mode identification. The stars are the best test bed in the sky for atomic diffusion. They're the case where it goes to the extreme. They are the case for which atomic diffusion theory was initially um, discovered, worked on by Everett Schatzman, Francoise Prodery, Georges Michaud, and so on. With the stabilization from the magnetic field, radiative levitation actually lifts rare earth elements high into the atmosphere of these stars. And that's what I'm showing you in this lower right part of this diagram. The iron typically forms down at what you would call continuum optical depth one. But above the hydrogen formation layer, things like neodymium and presidymium are lifted by the radiation until they float in cirrus clouds in what you would call the chromosphere in the sun. And so these stars are exceptional. Other than the sun, these are the stars where we actually can see up to chromospheric levels and look at the geometry and the structure of the atmosphere because the elements are stratified. So there's some very special information that we can get from these stars. Just to prove to you how strong the magnetic fields are, that's a 25 gau kilogauss field in a pulsating star, a pulsating A star, and there you can easily see the Zeeman components. The pulsation geometry is not simple. I originally, when I invented the theory for it, just thought, all right, it's a simple oscillation along the magnetic axis. It turns out, as with most things in science, it's more complex than that. But the pulsation axis is somewhere along the line between the rotation axis and the magnetic axis. But even that is becoming more complicated, and that's part of what I'm here to tell you about today. Let me show you what that radiative levitation does. This is a Doppler imaging of one of these pulsating stars where we had three nights contemporaneously with the 8-meter Subaru telescope in Hawaii and the 8-meter VLT in Chile. And the rotation period is around three days for this star, so we could cover a full rotation. On the left, what you're looking at is four different rotations where we've reconstructed the spots in neodymium on the star. The bottoms are Mercator projection of that. And what I would like you to note is that the solar abundance of neodymium on a scale of hydrogen is 12. Uh, the solar abundance for neodymium is about 1.4 on this scale. In this star, the neodymium is pushing eight. It's more than a million times overabundant compared to the sun. These stars are exceedingly peculiar, so peculiar that in that star I can see hydrogen spots. Have you ever even had the concept of hydrogen spots in a star? Well, what's happened? The overabundances of the rare earths are so strong at the magnetic poles that the temperature structure of the star is completely changed. And so when you measure radio velocity in the H alpha line, as I've done right here, the top diagrams with the pulsation in, I've removed the pulsations in the bottom. You can see a very strong three kilometer per second rotation because the hydrogen is not uniformly distributed across the star either. So there's some extreme astrophysics that we can try to probe in these stars. Because of that, a group of us led by Margarita Cunha proposed that we observe 1,200 peculiar A stars that had spectral classifications that suggest they would have strong magnetic fields with, with the test mission to try to map out parameter space, discover many new objects, and learn more about them. From the ground up until tests, even including Kepler, we'd only ever discovered about 70 of these stars. I anticipated we would discover hundreds with tests. That turns out not to be true. They are really, truly rare. And that's come out of this work that you see the titles of for these very recent papers here. One of the major things we were trying to discover was a test of Margarita Cunha's theory about where the instability strip should lie for these stars if we really understand them. And in Margarita's paper here from 2002 on the bottom, she had mapped out a theoretical instability strip, which is where these blue vertical lines are. 
Prior to the test mission, the instability strip of the observed stars lied between where I put these yellowish-orange lines, and it still does. So we have a problem understanding the excitation mechanism and exactly where these stars lie in the HR diagram. But that's not what I came to tell you about today. I want to talk to you about the pulsations in these stars and what information, what problems it's causing for the oblique pulsator model. Here's a particular test star, which I find to be one of the most interesting we've discovered. This is just to show you how complex the spots can be. These are not simple spots just at the magnetic poles. The spot structure can be highly non-dipolar, and there you can see with rotation multiple spots. That particular star has got the shortest period we found yet in these stars. That period is well above the acoustic cutoff frequency, but the stars are not primarily acoustic pulsators. They're primarily magnetic pulsators. That's not a problem. What I would like you to note here is how lovely this is from the point of view of somebody who works on solar-like stars. An oblique pulsator will generate a multiplet. This happens to be the multiplet from a quadrupole, but those are not five pulsation frequencies. That's a quadrupole pulsation with one frequency, the central peak. And the other peaks that you see are describing the amplitude and phase modulation as that mode is seen from different aspects with rotation of the star. The dipoles generate triplets, and the amplitude of the side lobes gives you the geometry of the pulsation mode. You'll notice in this star a triplet dipole, quadrupole, dipole, quadrupole, dipole. There's the large separation. There's the mode identification. That star is a real great target for eventually for excellent modeling. We also can look at three-dimensional behavior of the pulsation in spectroscopy. Um, I remind you that when you look at a spectral line in a star to zeroth order, that's really a map of the intensity at different depths. If you like, it's a map of temperature to the fourth power from deeper in the star up in the continuum to much higher in the atmosphere in the center of a high opacity line. And so all we've done with our spectra taken largely with VLT at high resolution is we take cuts through the line and we sample the pulsation amplitude as a function of depth in the line, which means coming higher and higher into the atmosphere. And there you can see the pulsation growing in amplitude out into the chromosphere with a constant phase. And then by going to doubly ionized neodymium, which actually forms above the hydrogen layer, we can watch that amplitude come back down again. There's a slight phase shift, so there's a traveling wave component coming out also. One of the examinations in one of these stars that I got excited about long ago was this particular iron line in the star I showed you the spots on, where by taking cuts through the iron line, we watch the amplitude go from a kilometer and a half per second. As we come down in the line, we're coming out into the atmosphere, the amplitude drops to zero, and then it comes back up again with a 180 degree phase shift. Why doesn't that just look like you're looking at a node? The answer is yes, it does look like that, but no, that's not what's happening. The theoretical work has been done by Margarita, Joanna Souza, and more recently, Paula um, Quitro Manasalva. And here's a better look at how complex the situation is. On the left, you're just looking at different layers in the outer atmosphere um, and the amplitude as a function of one pulsation phase. I'd like you to look on the right-hand side where you look at the pulsation amplitude and phase for the two components. The parallel component here is the acoustic component, and deep in the atmosphere, thank you, thank you, Mario. Deep in the atmosphere, where the pressure dominates, it's primarily an um, acoustic mode. Higher in the atmosphere, it's magnetic. And what happens is you get a 180 phase flip between, because of the combination of those two things, not because you're looking at a node. Well, with Kepler, we managed to look at a star. There's its rotation curve where we could see two dipole modes. And again, I remind you that these multiplets are not multiple pulsations. That's the only pulsation. This describes the geometry. This is the large separation. And these two modes are both dipoles, but they have different geometries. Um, the best hypothesis for that is that the two modes have got different pulsation axes. That's novel, and it's not understood. How and why should a star have two pulsation modes pulsating in different directions? And I don't have an answer to that. It was a novel result. But here's where the problem comes. We can map out the pulsation amplitude as a function of rotation in the star. And there you can see the two poles of the pulsation coming around from different aspects, jumping by 180 degrees because it's a dipole. And so what we've done is we've done that with tests for this star, HD 6532. Back in 1992, 
I observed that with other people and we found a quintuplet. It's a dipole mode and the mode amplitudes tell you the geometry of the mode. There are the test data and the test data have a completely different geometry. The people who wrote that paper, including Margarita, concluded that maybe the oblique pulsator model is completely wrong and we need a, a totally new idea. I don't like that very much, although I admit it's a possibility. Maybe the star completely changed its pulsation mode. Sorry, it's pulsation axis. Can stars do that? Is that possible? I don't like that idea very much anymore. What I'm more interested in is could the geometry look very, very different at different depths? Because the blue data are looking at quite a different depth to the red data. The red data, the opacity is lower and you're looking deeper into the atmosphere. We can test that with ground-based data. We can do a multi-site campaign from the ground on one of these stars in many different colors and find out or at least get some constraints on this problem. But at the moment, after 40 years, we've got some problems with how much we believe in the oblique, believe in the oblique model, even though the stars appear to be obliquely pulsating. These are just rotation curves for these stars. This is the one we were just looking at. And it's to show you that in the U, in the ultraviolet, and the blue, the spots will give you a maximum brightness, when in the red, they give you a minimum. And this, again, is because you're looking at different depths. Uh, depth may be the answer. I'm going to conjecture that, but the observations will tell. And I have just a couple minutes left, I think, Mario. And so I want to jump to a completely different subject. It's nice to be up to date on things, and so I want to bring you up to date to within the last few days. We've just submitted a paper to Nature Astronomy on this star, HD 74423. Uh, um, Jim theory on this. This is a obviously MESA plot with the star plotted with, plotted with Gaia luminosity. It's well post terminal age main sequence. It is a Lambda Buddha star. So Benjamin, you're sitting out there. Yeah, this one should make you happy. Definitely post main sequence, but it's not the Lambda Buddha characteristic I want to tell you about. It's an ellipsoidal variable. The orbital period is 1.6 days and it is the first oblique pulsator where the pulsation axis is the tidal axis of the star. I've been expecting this for decades. It's just they've been very hard to find. Here's the orbital light variation of the star. It's an ellipsoidal variable. So the deepest dip comes when the L1 points towards you. The shallowest of the dips comes when the L1 points in the opposite direction. And you'll see in this star that when the L1 points towards you, the star pulsates. When it's away from you, it doesn't. And the first thing we called it was a single-sided pulsator that only pulsated on one side. That doesn't really seem very likely, does it? A better way of describing it now, and Jim and I have been talking about names for these, is a tidally enhanced pulsator, where because on the L1 side the atmosphere is extended, then in the part of the atmosphere you're looking photometrically, the temperature variation, the amplitude variation is higher, the density is much lower. And so with the, rotate, with the orbital period of the star, you're seeing pulsation of very different amplitude in the two hemispheres. The interesting thing for me is that the tidal axis can actually be the pulsation axis. I've been expecting that, as I said, for decades. And finally, here it's come, and it's now a class. There's the multiplet that shows the pulsation. And from the amplitudes and phases, it was easy for me to show that that's oblique pulsation, not multiple pulsation modes. There is the pulsation amplitude as a function of orbit, high amplitude when the L one's towards you, not quite to zero when the other side's there. Phase jumps by 180 degrees, nice dipole, and beautifully maximum pulsation when the star's dimmest in its orbital phase. That's a signature of oblique pulsation. Jim's done some visibility calculations for this star and finds that for the L one side, the amplitude expected is about 30 times higher than expected on the opposite side. And that number is a little bit too large for the observations, but clearly going in the right direction. And um, we're expecting a theoretical. Where are you, Jim? He skipped this session. I'm expecting a paper from him on this soon. So a few days ago, this came in, sector 14. Here's the second one. I can't tell you its name yet. I only made the plot yesterday. And I've got collaborators. But there's a, the second of these. Um, one-sided pulsators. It happens to have four frequencies, all separated by less than six microhertz, but of low overtone. These must be mixed modes. And so I think that there's a tremendous amount of astrophysics that we'll be able to extract from these stars too. 
There's the set of pulsations, low frequency for a delta scuti star. That's what you would expect for radial overtone of zero or one, and yet very, very closely spaced. And so mixed modes almost certainly have to be the answer. They're coupled. The highest peak out here is, in fact, the combination term, not a harmonic. So we know that they're coupled also oscillators. I'm just beginning to work on that. Can't tell you any more right now. Thanks for your attention. It's all about tests providing absolutely new astrophysical inference when it went out to look for planets. Thank Thanks you very Lynn. much. Very much. So we have time for comments or questions? Marguerite, please. Hi, Don. Thanks for a great talk. A um, couple of questions. So going back to that uh, star, that uh, ROP star in which the um, geometry apparently changed significantly, is, can you remind me, is it bright enough that we could do a radio velocity um, uh, study? Because that, that would clear the case of whether it is a change due to the fact that you're looking at different levels in the atmosphere. The, the answer is, Marguerite, it's, it's about eighth magnitude. And yes, you can do radio velocity. You can do it. So we should think about doing that then. Uh, the other thing is, with respect to these new um, pulsators that you've just mentioned, it's quite exciting. Have you thought or can, can you tell us a little bit about what you expect you can learn in terms of the physics and in terms of dynamics of the system from finding these pulsators? Right. That question is, what can we learn from these pulsations being along the um, tidal axis? And let me just turn that into a question. Amongst the Delta Scuti stars, or amongst the A and F stars, there are many short period binaries with periods of one, two, or three days. They're frequently AM stars, as the second one I just showed you is. I've looked for pulsations in those stars for a long time. My non, um, not well studied impression is that pulsations are suppressed in those closed binaries, but they do happen. Why don't all of them pulsate with modes along the tidal axis? How are the tides interacting with the pulsations? You'll know that in recent years, we've started looking at tides and pulsations in the heartbeat stars. This is a completely different situation. So I can't specifically answer your question, except I don't understand why these stars are rare, why only some stars are pulsating in close binaries, and why some of those that do have got axes that are tidal axes, the others apparently not. And my hope is that the answers to those questions will provide interesting astrophysics. But I can't tell you what it is right now. Yes, one, please. It's sort of related to what you, what you just said, but I, I wonder, for these one-sided pulsators, why did we find them with TESS but not with Kepler? Is it just, a num is it just that they're so rare that all the, um, I mean, we've had lots of ellipsoidal variables in, in Kepler as well, and Delta Scuti stars too. So I guess, do you have a, an estimate of the occurrence or the fraction of stars that show Okay, I, I do have a tentative answer to that question because we've been thinking about that, Dan. Um, the second star I showed you has got four obvious pulsation frequencies, and that is enough to confuse the situation in terms of seeing the oblique pulsation pattern. The first one had only one mode, and that made things clear. So it may be there are lots of them, but they're multi-mode pulsators, and we're not recognizing what that hump is. The second thing is, is that who's finding these things for us? And the answer is the amateurs are. We've got people out there who are doing not artificial intelligence, but real intelligence <laughs> on large data sets. And they're finding really interesting things, and I'm not sure we had the same kind of search through the Kepler data yet. But it might be worth to go back to the Kepler oh, data. Oh, no, absolutely. I, um, they're, they're in my computer right there. Yeah, the thought's there. It's just a matter of time. Yeah, I agree. Questions, comments? your statement that um, in one of the slides you said that the oblique uh, pulsator model, standard model, might be wrong. That's a very strong statement. And um, could it not be that there are some physical effects that now uh, with current observations you see that were not included in that? Or could you not blame magnetic field or centrifugal force? Or Break, I agree with your first statement. That's very strong. And in fact, I, I really disliked it when the authors made that statement, authors. <laughs> <laughs> um, my speculation was that this is a depth effect. But even if that's true, it means that when you look at different depth, you conclude a different geometry. And one has to then be very cautious about the inference you're making from a single color in a photometric observation about what the true geometry of the pulsation mode is. 
when if you looked at a different depth, you might get a very different answer. And so we can certainly conclude that the oblique pulsation is much more complex than we thought previously. Thank you, Don. Okay, very thank much. you. So we move on to the last talk of this session. We have with uh, Sky to tell us a bit more of astroseismology with magnetic fields. Well, while this thing's booting up, I can just share a little uh, of my remembrance with, uh, with Mike. And as I've, I've had the opportunity to have dinner with uh, Mike and Kate at Uri's several times and enjoy their, their lovely company. And uh, is it? Oh, great. So today I'll be talking a little bit about uh, more about esteroseismology of magnetic fields. We've heard a little bit from Jim and, and quite a bit from Lisa on this topic already. But uh, I'll show some more general aspects of this and some other applications of, uh, of esteroseismology from magnetic fields. But first, I just wanted to share one little personal note. So much like uh, uh, Kate, I lost my sister four years ago. And uh, I just wanted to have a little thought on this. And this is there's a little bit of context here. And this is um, a picture from the Paul Getty Museum in their gardens. And I had uh, visited LA as part of getting my visa to move to France about a month after my sister passed away. And this picture just always reminds me of there's beauty in life and beauty in death, just as there's beauty in doing work and also in this remembrance. And thank you for allowing me to participate in this one. Okay, so for remembrance, this is a, a lovely historical path that led to the paper that kind of inspired my work on this uh, topic. And as much as Yvonne mentioned in her talk, there's Ritter's memoirs from the late uh, 19th century that really first postulated that there might be magnetic influences on pulsations. This was followed on by Moulton in 1909, much, uh, much again for R.R. Leary type stars and other variable stars. And eventually, about uh, 40 years later, we had some other work, both not on magnetic fields itself, but just on non-radial oscillations in stars from cowling and then on rotating stars. And uh, Martin Schwarzschild, the, the son of, uh, of Carl Schwarzschild, who also became an astrophysicist, uh, did the first work on magnetic oscillations that I could find. Um, and continuing on down the list, we have, of course, this wonderful paper by uh, Ledoux and Volraven. It's uh, something like 70 or 80 pages on variable stars. It's just fantastic, very, very well written. Um, hard to find, but you can. Um, and of course, we have the, the work by Lynn Bell and Ostricker on stability of differentially rotating stars, and uh, per, um, some very fundamental work by Goosens. Um, I think he's from Leuven. Um, but on the perturbations of, uh, of oscillations uh, due to magnetic fields, uh, both singular perturbations at the, at the surface and also in the interior. And then, of course, we have work by Douglas, who originally, much like me, was uh, dealing with convection quite a lot. Um, and then moving on to doing uh, more, more solar-related uh, stereoseismology and helioseismology a bit later in his career. But of course, what really inspires us are pictures like these. So this is something from my thesis I just did for fun. And this is looking at 24-hour uh, average of HMI data to get, uh, to get uh, super granulation patterns. And superimposed is the, uh, on the other side is uh, magnetogram from that same period. But in it, you can just see the complexity of what we're dealing with. So going further down the rabbit hole, uh, so this is really the, the kind of fundamental results to me of, uh, of uh, Mike and uh, Douglas's paper. So we have, of course, uh, the basic um, equation for um, eigenmodes and eigenfrequencies for oscillations in stars. We have a, linear, a hydrodynamic piece due to uh, pressure, buoyancy uh, and uh, stratification. We have, of course, Coriolis forces and uh, evective forces and some nonlinear terms as well. And the piece that I want to focus on is this last one, is this last one. Um, so in their work, they, 
break this into two pieces, so or into many pieces if you do the full perturbative expansion, I will only really be concentrating on this term. But they've also looked at uh, the influence of Coriolis forces, so of course the, the rotational splitting of modes. But you can also look at uh, the magnetic splittings and shifts of shift modes. And there's two pieces to this. There's the direct magnetic effects of the Lorentz force, and then there's the indirect magnetic effects due to the distortion of the star, due to the magnetic field. And likewise, there's similar terms uh, due to rotation or any other body force that you apply. So if we look at uh, much like, I think Margarita talked about this just the other day. And uh, if we look at, in this case, it's a fairly unrealistic field of about uh, 10 megagauss or 30 megagauss, I don't remember exactly what it was. We can look at the, the influence on the frequency sh uh, splittings due to the direct effect, which is this one, which is about six uh, microhertz for this really strong field that's concentrated in the tachycline. And if you include the, uh, the so-called indirect effects, so this distortional effects in the star, these are about 14 microhertz, so they're quite large with this strong perturbation, uh, strong perturbative field. Now if we do a little bit more realistic job of this, so this is work by uh, Rene Kiefer and Marcus Ross from a, a couple of years ago, they kind of revisited this even even more general sense. And there's lots of nasty mathematics behind that, and you'll see a little bit of that in this talk, but not a, not a lot. Um, so the idea is, again, you put a field, a toroidal field in the tachycline. It's relatively confined, but now we're much more in line with what we think the magnetic fields are there from, from simulations. So these are about 50 kilogauss fields. So if we look at the, the total induced shifts, we have, uh, they're much more, much smaller, about a, about a factor of 10 smaller. Uh, so you have shifts of about a, a microhertz or so, at least in the sun. And this again can be split into two pieces, the direct effect due to the Lorentz force directly, and then the distortional effects due to the indirect, effect, indirect effects. And I point you to, as they say in their, in their um, uh, caption, uh, the shift in the magnitude is quite enormous. It's about a factor of 100 lower for those indirect effects. Now, it doesn't say that this is not always in, not important, but for this particular instance, this is not an important effect. And more recently, this is work by my, um, my office mate, Malsan Prats, and this is basically what Lisa has used to do uh, red giant and magneto asteroseismology as well. Uh, so he's looked at the influence in a more massive star, three solar mass star, of a uh, colloidal field in particular. Well, this is a, the same field that Lisa is looking at. It's a, there's a toroidal component and a colloidal component, but as we know, the most important part of that is the radial field. So if we look at this uh, non-perturbative uh, framework and we look at how the, frequent, the period spacings change, both due to rotation, which is this general trend, and also to an increasingly large magnetic field, you can see that there are some impacts, larger impacts, on that period spacing that might be detectable. Okay, so we've looked at axisymmetric fields, or even oblique dipoles. So this is work that came after uh, Douglas's and uh, Mike's work in 1990. But let's, we can actually look at even more complex fields, things that are completely non-axisymmetric that are thought to be fossile fields. There's some support for this, both theoretically, or at least through simulations, which uh, you have the work of Braithwaite that has shown that given initially fairly simple field, it can relax to a, a state of kind of minimum energy that is quite complicated and very non axisymmetric And if we look at spectral polarimetry, we often find such kinds of fields. But moreover, we have uh, simulations of these kinds of, of massive stars, both by Nick Featherstone and myself and a few others, where we have found that indeed those fields are very non axisymmetric They have weak mean fields, but very strong fluctuating fields. So again, very non axisymmetric so what we're looking at here is a simulation of a 10 solar mass star with about 60% of the star by radius using ash. So this is work with Yuri and Sasha, where we have a convective core whose motions excite waves. There's no magnetic field out here, given the initial condition, there's very little anyway. And so these are primarily gravito inertial modes. And on the next picture, we have an equatorial cut of the magnetic field itself. So this is uh, showing fields of strength in white of about one gauss in blue of about 100 kilogauss, and then the strongest fields are around a megagauss in this, uh, in this core, all dynamo-induced. We can take a little peek about what those motions look like in the core. So these are the things that will be exciting the, the waves that we observe. So one piece that's actually not shown in the original eigenvalue equation 
is what is the source term of this? And this is our source term, at least an approximation of it, given some motion. So what you're seeing is flows on the outside of the core. You know, we cut away. These are radial velocities, so outwards is red, downwards is blue. There you have very complicated core crossing flows that thread magnetic field throughout this entire region. But we can also say, okay, well, we have this convection, what sort of amplitude wave does it excite? So if we look at several different cases, and here we're changing the rotation rate by up to about a factor of four, you have your pretty typical mixing length values of uh, convection in the uh, convective core, which is here. And then outside the core, you excite waves whose amplitude increases as you increase the rotation rate. And indeed, if you look at the spectrum of excited waves, you do see those discrete Gravito inertial modes that you would expect. Here we have an, uh, gravity waves in an isothermal atmosphere for comparison. And here's the Br local Brunt Weissauer frequency and the, the maximum Brunt Weissauer frequency in the, in the uh, radiative cavity. You can see progressive modes and again the discrete uh, normal modes. Skip over that for interest of time. Uh, so on to my recent work. So this is work that I did with Stefan Matisse. Um, originally it was geared towards the, the non-axisymmetric uh, Taylor instability. We then extended it on to, uh, to look at uh, what happens for a general non-axisymmetric magnetic field in terms of the eigenmodes and eigenfrequencies that we can see in stars. So again, much like in Mike's work, we have the hydrodynamic pieces. Here I have not taken the cowling approximation, but instead I do retain the, uh, the full um, self-gravity term. We have the Coriolis term and of course the Lorentz forces. So here, unlike what many people have done, which is to use the RST basis, uh, I have used a, something called the spin vector harmonic basis, which provides a natural means of expressing operators in, uh, in spherical and in distorted spaces in a relatively compact way, even for this really general case. So, of course, we have to use degenerate perturbation theory. We're using uh, eigenmodes from a non-rotating star, and we have a, a complex uh, eigenvalue problem, so a generalized eigenvalue problem for the splittings and shifts, which are represented by this uh, eigenvalue omega b. Uh, we have the general matrix element, which includes all the processes that we're uh, looking at, so indirect, indirect effects of the magnetic field perturbing the thermodynamic state. We have indirect uh, impacts on the rest of the hydrodynamics, so on the pressure field, on the sound speed, and various other terms that are in, in this uh, hydrodynamic uh, operator. We have uh, Coriolis terms acting on the first order perturbations uh, of the eigenfunctions, and then of course the Lorentz forces. So just to give you an idea of why we want to use these. So yesterday we saw Lisa's talk where she had this enormous notebook full of very complicated integrals um, over Hoff functions. So the difference here is that we take a representation that allows us to compute those integrals analytically. So these are basically just uh, things that are very common from in the last 70 or 80 years of quantum mechanics, which allows you to basically have combinatorical representations of those integrals, so exact representations of those integrals. Um, which will in encapsulate all of the information about the coupling of the different components of the magnetic field with the eigenmodes. So, so some of these values will be small for certain values of m and j and l, and other values will be large. And you can do asymptotics on these to understand exactly what and where those kinds of uh, values will be important. A similar kind of operator expansion for the curl. But really what I want to show you is this. So this is what Lisa and Jim showed us yesterday. It looks very complicated, but really it's actually quite simple. Uh, so the Lorentz effect is decomposed into three pieces. You have a current term, you have a tension term, and a compression term. So here we have exactly those expanded out on that uh, spherical harmonic basis. So all that we're left with are radial integrals over the eigenfunctions and the magnetic field components themselves. And of course, these combinatorical numerical pieces. So as we saw yesterday, the one that is asymptotically important for, say, G modes, is this term, the tension term. And basically the reason is that you have a second order derivative here. So using JD, JWKB approximation, the term becomes gone. So just one last piece, how much time do I have left? Two minutes? Okay, perfect. So one last piece, so I mentioned the indirect effects. So of course you can have the indirect effects of a magnetic field, but you can also have the indirect effects of tides, of oblateness, and all of these things can be handled using a, what Mike has done in his paper and what was done also in Simon Leibovitz 
is to express, uh, to basically remap those distorted coordinates back onto the sphere. And so in doing so, you just have the Jacobian of the transformation. And this, this factor H here is something that you will solve for given the perturbations of the thermodynamic system as well as that of the gravitational potential. So basically what you have are these two equations, which then give you two coupled ODEs for each L and M that you can then solve for this function H, which then gives you your distortional perturbations of the sphere uh, mapped back onto the sphere. And this is quite interesting because you can then apply this in multiple different ways using this one formalism. So for instance, if instead of considering magnetic fields, you consider tides, this expansion parameter delta becomes really just this simple quantity where uh, M2 and M1 are the two masses of the, of the binary system, R is the radius of the object of question, and D is the distance between them. So for, let's say, about 10% effects, you only have to be within about a factor of two radii. So you can really apply this for quite tight binary systems. Uh, moreover, you can, of course, apply this for ablateness, which has already been done quite extensively in the literature, and like I mentioned, also for the magnetic field. So for very strong magnetic fields, especially near the surface where it will have very strong effects, this will be an interesting thing to look at in detail in terms of how it will affect the mode spectrum. Um, okay, so I'll just leave you with the, my conclusions here. So basically what we've done is we've taken a very general kind of theory and applied it to this, our familiar stereoseismic systems in a very um, systematic way in such that we can apply it to many different kinds of forces. But moreover, beyond just uh, using this for stereoseismology, we can use these projection techniques in numerical simulations to look at oblateness and tides, but still use spectral codes without having to look in the deformed geometry. So this is actually quite a powerful technique that should be applied in numerical simulations as well. I'll leave you with that since I'm out of time. Thank you very much, Kyle. We are running a little bit later, but there are time for questions. Yes, please, go ahead. Okay. So it sounds like, from what you're saying, the indirect effects of the changes in the stratification and so forth are, are generally much larger than the direct Lorentz force effects on the frequencies, for example. They can be. So how can, if from an observational standpoint, how can you actually tell that the perturbations you're seeing are actually due to a magnetic field and not due to some thermal perturbation, for example? I don't know if you can disentangle it very easily. Sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, it's degenerate, so I'm not sure if you can disentangle them so easily without additional information from other kinds of modes. Yes, Margarita, please. Hey, um, thanks for the talk, very interesting. Uh, so going back to the, that issue of comparing the direct and indirect effects, I should just uh, um, say, and um, perhaps you can clarify, maybe I missed something, but I mean, I imagine that is true if you are in, the, in, in, in a situation in which you have a buried field. You have a buried field. In which you have a buried field. This is not buried. Then up near the photosphere, the, 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 the direct effect is definitely the, 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 the direct effect is definitely you cannot do a perturbative uh, approach exactly. at all. Okay, exactly. so I think we agree on that, right? Yes, very much so. Okay. And it becomes lossy at that, right? If you have an open field. Uh, this is something that Brad and I have actually discussed. Yeah, because, because we, I mean, in the sun that has been worked out by Paul Carl and so on, and we worked on that also for the AP stars, is exactly that case. Actually, in that case, we have a simple um, dipole field which would not interfere with the structure. So essentially, what you have is, uh, and you cannot use a uh, perturbative field in that case. I definitely agree with this. Thank statement. you. <laughs> yes, Mark. Yes, Marcus, please. Mine. Yeah, maybe to add to this discussion, in the end we want to know where the magnetic field is, whether it has a direct or effect or an indirect effect. We don't care. Uh, it, has an so effect. it has an effect. <laughs> it has a direct and an indirect effect on the, at the place where it is. So um, in the end, if we can locate it um, and can do it via the direct or the indirect effect, we, we are happy if we know where the magnetic field is. 
Sorry, I, I'm just saying that to model it, you have to have a realistic approach. And if you know that your, your magnetic field penetrates the surface, you cannot do a perturbative analysis. You will not capture the effect in that way, okay? If it's strong, of course. Yeah, if it's strong there. But if we want to look in the deep interior, I think like we would be happy if we could have... Like say a G-mode, for instance. It's not quite as... Uh... Let's thank Kyle again. Thank you, Kyle. And before, before we break... Let, let me just remind you that we are going now immediately to the photo outside. And